Hello everybody, my name is Alex Dahl. I'm a grinding specialist who works with the Segling.com software. This video is the sixth in the series that is talking about mineral grinding concepts and the Segling.com software. And we're going to specifically talk in this video about mill power draw models. So we'll start with the problem statement. How do we as designers or as operators estimate what the power draw should be for an industrial grinding mill. So there's two types of grinding mills that are typically seen in the industry. And this video is specifically dealing with the tumbling mills. We're not dealing with the, the vertical mills or the stirred mills. There's a couple of ways that we can generate these models. One of them is a fully empirical method where we will take uh, measurements in the field of an operating mill. And you read the power draw, you read off some, some geometric measures that you think are important. And the examples of this type of a model would be the bond model for the power draw in rod and ball mills, or the Nordberg model for, again, rod and ball mills. The semi-phenomenological models are based on a, some sort of a geometry and then you're trying to fit parameters that you observe in the field to the geometry. So an example of this is the Hogan first to know model or the Morel C model. We'll start with the bond model. There's a bunch of different versions of this that, that go back through the ages. Uh, this particular version comes from 2006 but all of them kind of have the same form where you work out how many kilowatts of power draw to expect from the mill per ton of balls in the mill. So we've got some geometric parameters here like the diameter of the mill. We've got some measurements like the speed of the mill as a fraction of uh, the percent of critical speed. We've got some volume measurements for the charge occupied uh, inside the mill, as well as a factor for the ball size. The Norberg model is similar in the sense that it's an empirical model, so it's based on a bunch of measurements. But this one is basically boils down to three nomographs and a density correction. So you've got a factor A, which is based on the diameter of the mill, a factor B, based on the volume filling, and a factor C, which is a function of the speed. And here are the three nomographs where, you know, back in the day, you could just literally read off the diameter, read up, read across, there's your factor A. For the factor B, same thing. You find your filling, read up, read across, there's your factor B, and you just multiply them together. The Hogan first to know model is based on a geometry that is assumed to be uh, existing inside of the mill where you have a, a sector of a disc which represents where the charge is sitting in the mill as it's turning. So as the mill's turning, the charge is effectively kind of pushed up onto the, 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 the uphill side of the rotation of the mill. And if you work out what the torque is of holding that charge in that position, you can turn that torque into a power measurement. I'm going to highlight here that there's an angle that the, the surface of this, uh, this disc segment makes that's kind of critical to this. And, and you can dial in a different value of alpha will give you a very different prediction of what the, the torque and what the power is going to be. And in fact, this alpha value is an empirical adjustment factor. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we look at some case studies. The One of the more common versions of the hog first to know model that's used is this one from Mollycock Tools. And again, it's got some geometric uh, measurements. You've got the diameter of the mill, length of the mill. You've got the speed of the mill as a fraction of the percent of critical. You've got the apparent density of the charge. So this includes the balls, the pulp. So the ore density affects the pulp density and the porosity of the balls and the density of the balls. That affects this, this apparent um, density of the charge inside the mill. Uh, we've got fraction filling is in here twice. And then we have this angle alpha, which we described earlier, as what is effectively a, an empirical calibration factor. 
There are case studies that have been published for, in this case, it's for sag milling, where authors of the Mollycop tool software have, have put out survey data that says for a sag milling application, you should be using about a 41 degree angle as that alpha value. For the ball mills, it's a little bit different. We're using 35 degrees in this, um, in this video. There are other angles you can use, and it's kind of up to the people who use the model to choose the appropriate number for their application. The final model we'll look at is the Morel C model. This is by far the most complicated model out of any of them. And to, to really kind of distill it down to its simplest, what it is is it's a friction balance between concentric arcs of, of slurry that are, are stacked up against the side of the mill as the mill's turning. There's way too per many parameters to list here. In fact, it takes up an entire chapter in the reference book. So I'm not going to be duplicating any of the equations here other than the the most highest level thing that, that you need to understand is that the gross power that it measures which is basically the electrical input power is based on a calibration value k which is empirically measured and it is specifically fit to the motor input power of induction type motors which leads into a discussion about power measurement because as you go through an electrical circuit from the, the electrical source as you move down through the different components of a circuit you'll lose voltage so there's a voltage drop across a transformer there might be a voltage drop across a variable speed drive or something like that there will be voltage drops across long conductors and as voltage drops so too does the power that exists at any particular part of the of the circuit. And what we're going to be dealing with in our discussion here is the power that is measured by the plant in their distributed control system in the DCS, which is approximately in the middle of this diagram and it relates to the power input block in the block diagram. Now be aware that when you're dealing with other models, things like the bond a work index model or the, the Morel MI model, often what they're dealing with is predicting the power draw at the pinion of the mill. So that's a mechanical power on the motor output and possibly on the other side of a gearbox versus what we're talking about today, which is the electrical power that is input into the motor. So there's electrical input power, that's today's discussion, and then there is motor mechanical output power, which is a bond work index kind of a number. So just be aware what we're talking about here, slightly different to what we've talked about in earlier videos. It's just measured, the power is measured at a different part of the electrical circuit. So we're going to run through three benchmarking studies to see how the four models line up with what was observed in the industry. So the first example we'll look at is Meadowbank, which is a Canadian gold mine up in the Arctic. And it's a you know, reasonable sized ball mill, 18 foot, not too big, not too small. Its um, geometric parameters are all pretty normal. The filling level, you know, 31%, pretty normal. You know, 32 would be like the most normal number. Critical speed, normally you'd be about 75%. They're at 76 and a little bit, so eh, a little bit high. Nothing, nothing outrageous. So when we look at the predictions that the four models give us, they're all extremely close to what was measured in the mill. And this is what we would hope to expect because the conditions that we're modeling here are all pretty normal. So another way to visualize this is we'll look at this chart where we show the different mill filling levels across the x-axis and how that affects the estimated power draw. And the reason we would want to view it this way is that the mill filling level will normally vary a little bit as the mill operates. So when the flow goes up, the filling level will rise. When the flow drops, the filling level drops a little bit. So you'd be kind of moving back and forth across some of these, um, some of these models. 
the target point up at the top there is what was actually measured in the survey. And you can see all of the models basically go through that target point. In fact, the target point might be just a smidge higher than what the models are predicting. So that that's generally very good. That says that the Meadowbank ball mill was operating very efficiently versus what the models would predict. Uh, just a little segue here for, for the hog first to know fans. The angle of alpha that you need to, to get bang on to the target was 36 and a half degrees versus the 35 degrees that we did the um, that we did the calculations at. So again, not much of an adjustment needed, but you could dial that up a little bit to give you the, a hog first to know model that gives you exactly what was measured in that survey. The second survey we'll look at comes from some published information from Santa Rita, which is a Brazilian nickel mine. It's got a slightly larger mill, but still pretty normal. But it's got a few other quirks here that the, the filling level is quite low. The reason for this is the, the actual paper that this data was taken from was talking about how the sag mill was operating in, a, in an inefficient form. It was a very sag limited circuit. So the ball mill is basically sitting there twiddling its thumbs, waiting for feed from the sag mill. So the filling level is low because the throughput is low because the operators are dealing with issues in the sag mill. The other thing to, I'm going to highlight here is that the ore density is quite a bit higher than what we've seen in these other models. So, so most of the, the calibration data to these models would have been ore densities in the range of about 2.5 to 2.9. So 2.7, 2.75 would be like an average number. We've got quite a bit higher density here, so that might affect some of the models more than the others. And when we look at the predictions that are made by the models, um, they're generally closer, um, but they're not as good as what we saw at Meadowbank. When we look at it in terms of the volumetric filling, we'll see that the target that it was the measurement that was made in the survey is below all of the models. So there's a couple possibilities for what we're seeing here. One of them is that some of the models, particularly the Nordberg model, might be overcorrecting for this high ore density and over predicting what the power could be for that mill operating in that geometry. Or there's a second possibility is that the mill is being run inefficiently, that the liners are not efficient, the lifters are not efficient. And that's probably what we've got in this situation, because I've already mentioned the operators are focused on getting the sag mill tuned up. They haven't got around yet to tuning up the ball mill. So what I think this is showing is that the survey compared to the models says that you should be able to do about 5% better power draw with this ball mill once it gets fully tuned up. So this is an example where you can use the models to try and predict where a tuned up mill should get to and then you can build that into your cash flow to say you know here's here's what the consultant's going to bring us when they tell us what this delta is. The third benchmarking survey we'll talk about is Fimiston in Australia. And it's got a couple of quirks in it. Um, the biggest quirk is that it has a very high filling level. Again, normally 32% would be a pretty normal number. So this very high filling level means that something has happened to the, the trunnions. They're, they're, they're very non-standard. Another thing I want to point out here is that in the paper, they describe the motor having a rated speed of 12.5 RPM. It's a fixed speed motor, but the actual percent of critical that was used in the survey is less than the rated speed of the mill. What's going on there is that this is an induction motor and induction motors have what's called a slip. So they don't operate at their rated speed. They operate at something less. So for you as an operator, when you're talking to a consultant or doing a survey, you need to give us 
the actual speed that you actually measured as the mill is turning rather than what it's supposed to be at 100% uh, rated speed because there's going to be some slip associated with these induction motors and that can can throw off the calculations. So when we look at the predictions, um, basically the Nordberg Hog first and are very close. The Morel models still close. It's within 5%. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But the Bond model is quite a bit out compared to the other ones. I mentioned that the bond model has a parameter in it associated with the ball diameter and the ball size. This ball mill has rather larger than normal um, balls, 80 millimeter balls. So normally you'd be expecting about a 50 millimeter ball in these things. So it's possible that that larger diameter ball is pushing the bond model outside of its calibration space. So we look at the chart here for the power draw as a function of filling. Again, the Hog First and O model at 35 degrees is bang on. Norberg model is pretty close. The Morel C model is a little bit high. Now, one of the authors of this paper was actually Steve Morel, who, who's the originator of this equation. And in the paper, he describes the when he runs the model, he gets a number that's much, much closer to that target. And I think the reason for this is that the Morel model has parameters in there for the diameter of the trunnions, which are not published in the paper. And it also has a parameter, which is the center line length from the feed to the discharge trunnions. So those were not in the paper. So I couldn't generate those based on um, when I'm running the model. Whereas during when he was working on the paper, presumably Steve Morrell had those measurements and he could plug them in and that caused the red line to drop down back into the red box. So the good news is that Morrell's model is much more complicated and it can get you much better numbers. But the bad news is you need to have way more numbers to get it to line up with these other models. Bond's model is really the only one that doesn't work well in this situation, and that's probably because of the ball diameter. So the conclusion, what should you take away from this? Well, first of all, all models are wrong, right? That's what models are. They're an imperfect representation of reality that we can mathematically use to make predictions. But some models are useful. And we've seen examples here of where you can use models to, to give good predictions of what uh, a competent operator should be able to achieve with a particular mill in a particular geometry. You've also seen an example here where the models can predict what a tuned up mill should be able to achieve once the operators get to the point that they're starting to tune up that mill and get it up to full throughput. But there are always going to be conditions where you might have a situation that is outside of the calibration space of a model, and that model is not going to give you a, a useful prediction. So um, the Nordberg model potentially suffers from that when you get into a high density ore. The Bond model can be quite sensitive to ball size. But overall, the Nordberg and the Morel models are very close across most of the surveys that I've looked at until you get into some really odd situations. You can use either one of them and you should get a reasonably good number. I use the Norberg model for design and I use the Morel model when I'm fitting surveys. Another model that's out there is this Hog First to Know model. It is widely used uh, and I mentioned Mollycock Tools is one example of the software that uses it. The trick is that the operator needs to have a good sense of what that angle alpha should be for the situation that they're trying to model. The bond model I mentioned is very sensitive to ball size and I don't use it. I don't think that it's reliable given that we have much better models now that are I'm much more comfortable working with. Liner configuration and liner wear will have an effect on these results. So one of the things that could be happening if you see 
a model predicting much higher than what you're, you've got in the mill. It could be that the charge is slipping over the liners because the lifters have worn down too much. So again, if you have a model of what's going on in the mill and you're measuring the power and the two don't line up, that's an indication that there's probably some um, something like wear that is affecting your milling circuit. And a final uh, comment to operators, please publish more papers in conferences because that's the only way that, that designers like me can, can tune these models and give you back the next generation of ball mills. Especially when we get into much larger diameter ball mills, we need to make sure that the models that we're working with do scale properly to these much larger diameter mills with much larger motors on them. And the only way that, that us designers can give you back the next generation of even bigger ball mills is if you can publish your ball mill data so that we can go back and check our models. So with that, I'll say thank you for watching this video and I will talk to you again in a future video. Bye bye. It's where people go out and measure what they think are the important components <clears throat> Beg your pardon.